Hi, it's Katrina. Is it Halloween? Because things are about to get creepy. A zombie tomb from ancient Rome, an island populated by brutal cannibals, skeletons packed into the Sphinx. Oh my, you're in for a wild ride in today's video, so be sure to subscribe and let's go. The Sphinx Tomb. The Great Sphinx of Egypt is packed with bodies and everything you know about this ancient monument is wrong. This is all according to a shocking new theory that claims the Sphinx is a tomb. It isn't just a statue, it's a hollow mortuary packed to the brim with skeletons. Other than the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Sphinx is the most iconic construct in all of Egypt. Some even say that it's twice as old as the pyramids. They claim it survived the biblical flood and wasn't even built by the Egyptians. Recent studies have suggested that the whole thing was made by wind erosion and had nothing to do with humans. But I covered that theory in another video, so be sure to check that one out. But what's the truth here? The truth is that most mainstream historians agree that the mythical Sphinx statue was built around the year 2558 BC. It was commissioned by Pharaoh Khafre, with the Sphinx's face being modeled after the face of the Pharaoh. The monument was originally meant to be part of a much larger funerary complex. In 1978, archaeologists found three huge stone blocks that were abandoned during the project. Archaeologists also found toolkits and a workman's preserved lunch at the Sphinx, suggesting that work ended abruptly. The workers may have walked off the job. It's further proof that the pyramid builders were in a labor union. Okay, but I did promise creepy bodies and I'm going to deliver. The Sphinx is littered with tunnels and openings. Some were made by treasure hunters trying to uncover glittering jewels within the bowels of the Sphinx. Others were made by people trying to re-carve the monument. But there are a few shafts made by unknown people for unknown reasons. There are also tunnels that supposedly lead to natural caves and other chambers underneath the Sphinx. There is a hole in the head of the Sphinx known as Shaft A. Archaeologists guess it was a deep hole used to attach a giant headdress to the monument when it was first made. However, it could also be the entrance to the tomb inside the monument's body. That's where some people think the bones are hiding. And there are way more openings than you might think. There is one on the Sphinx's back too, about four feet behind the head. It was made in the 1840s by archaeologist Howard Weiss. Howard was hoping to find something interesting inside the big stone cat. He didn't get down far enough to break into the supposed tomb chamber though. There is a hole between the paws of the Sphinx, another at the back, and then there is the keyhole shaft that's opposite the north hind paw. The keyhole shaft is one of the more interesting holes because researchers think it does lead to an unfinished tomb. There are also rumors that the keyhole shaft leads directly underneath the Sphinx's body, where an even greater treasure awaits. The greater treasure is a library that's said to be filled with mystical knowledge of the ancient world. If there is a library underneath the Sphinx, and archaeologists ever find it, it will be like entering the Library of Alexandria before it was burned down. But for now, nobody is willing to make any more holes in the Sphinx to find out its secrets. And now for a quick break. On Origins Explained, as you know, we dive deep into the mysteries of the past, exploring ancient cultures and civilizations. Today, I'm incredibly excited to share something a bit different with you, my favorite tool for bringing those ancient languages to life, right in the palm of your hand. That's right, it's Babbel, my favorite app for learning a new language, perfectly designed to help you master a new language through real life conversations, you know, with phrases you can actually use. You can start speaking a new language within three weeks. Why learn a new language? Why not is the question. It's really good for your brain and it's quick and easy for those moments you want some downtime throughout the day, you know, when you're not watching YouTube. For me, it's also really helpful to improve my pronunciation of names and locations because I cover a lot of places on this channel. Whether it's for travel, connecting with family, advancing your career, or just the thrill of learning, what's your reason? I speak Spanish, but I studied French in high school and pretty much forgot all of it. You know what they say, if you don't use it, you lose it. 
This summer I have plans to go to Brussels, so I want to brush up on my French so I can get around a little more easily when I visit my friends. At least enough to catch a train and order some food, and improving my pronunciation for names of famous archaeologists and French places doesn't hurt either. And they offer a 20-day money-back guarantee, so it's a no-brainer. Ready to kickstart your own language learning adventure? Click the link below for 60% off your Babbel subscription. I'm really curious, what language do you want to learn and why? Let me know in the comments. Thanks so much again to Babbel for sponsoring this video, and now let's dive back into it. The Passage to the Underworld There is a mysterious place in Scotland that's designed to allow the dead access to the underworld. It's creepy, a little weird, and you're going to love it. Thousands of years before today, the Orkney Islands of Scotland were populated by a group of Neolithic people. These people came together and built burial mounds where they would honor their dead. Important people in their society were laid to rest inside the burial mounds, and sometimes so were their pet dogs. The biggest of all the Neolithic tombs in the Orkney Islands is Maze Howe. It's impressive by any standard. It's absolutely humongous and connected to the stars. Each year on the winter solstice, the sun shines directly into the entrance, filling the passageway with blinding light. But there is one bizarre twist in this great mound. Underneath the giant hill of dirt, which is now overgrown with grass and protected by a flimsy wire fence, there is a vast chamber. The chamber is upside down. Local scientists from the University of the Highlands found that the burial chamber was built inverse, the wrong way up compared to all other burial chambers in similar mounds. The how of it isn't as complicated as you might think. Jay van der Rijden from the university explained that the architectural features are flipped. This was likely done to make it seem as if the chamber was within the netherworld. It's starting to look like Maze How wasn't just a burial mound. It was built an estimated 5,000 years ago to act as a sort of portal to the underworld. Bone Flower Some seriously strange stuff has happened throughout history, and a weird amount of it seems to be concentrated in France. Like, did you know that in the late 16th century, desperate French bakers ground human bones into flour to make bread? In 1590, Paris was in the midst of a religious war. It was literally called the Wars of Religion, waged between the Catholic League and the French Royal Army. The army laid siege to Paris, which was being controlled by the Catholics at the time. The army wanted to starve the city into submission. This was a classic siege tactic used when mass bloodshed wasn't an option. However, you might argue it was worse, since people slowly starved to death. Dire times call for extreme measures and hunger can make people do some very unusual things. Pierre de la Estoile, a clerk at the French Parliament, recorded the lengths that Parisians went to in order to get food. They were so desperate that they started excavating bones from the Cemetery of the Innocents. The bones were ground into flour, which was then used to bake bread. So the French ate bread from human bones and everybody was happy, right? I could stop here and pretend there was a happy ending, but that wouldn't be historically accurate. The truth is that the people who ate the bone bread met a terrible fate. They all died. For years, scientists have been trying to figure out what it was that caused everyone who ate the bone bread to perish. It was thought that maybe the bones had a toxic substance in them, maybe arsenic. It's also been suggested that the people suffered such psychological trauma from consuming the bones of their ancestors that they died. Recently, though, a more likely explanation has come to the surface. Scientists suspect that the bone bread lacked adequate nutrients. Human bones are rich in minerals like calcium, but our bones aren't packed full of calories or nutrients. People who were eating bone bread as their primary food source likely suffered digestive issues, things like intestinal blockages and these issues proved fatal. The Restless Dead When researchers opened a tomb that was previously sealed for 2,000 years, what they found shocked them to their core. And it's going to shock you as well. Experts believe the ancient tomb was created by the Romans, who were fearful of zombies. What I'm trying to say is that archaeologists have found a zombie tomb. The zombie tomb dates back to 100 AD. It was recently unearthed at the archaeological site of Sagalassos in southwestern Turkey. 
Within the tomb, archaeologists identified the cremated remains of an adult male. Cremation wasn't that unusual in the Roman Empire. The unusual part was the odd assortment of nails discovered in the tomb. Scientists with the Sagalassos Archaeological Research Project found nails scattered across the floor, likely deposited during a creepy ritual. Whoever built the tomb and cremated the man in it must have been afraid that the dead guy's spirit would come back to haunt them. The deceased wouldn't come back as a physical zombie, though that would make for an awesome movie. I'm thinking the fall of Rome during a zombie outbreak, Legionnaires versus the undead. If a movie like that comes out soon, you'll know where they got the idea. The tomb gets even weirder, though. The ashes of the cremated man were discovered in the remains of a pyre. The pyre had been sealed with 24 bricks while the flames were still roaring. What this means is that the dead person was set ablaze and then sealed inside a box of bricks while his body still burned. Plus, all the random nails were thrown in as part of whatever crazy ritual was happening. Researcher Johann Clay said that the ceremony was most likely performed by the man's family. They likely cared for him but were terrified of him at the same time. There may be a few of you out there who can sympathize with that. The man's family wanted to be shielded from him, even after death. What could have made the family members believe that their loved one would come back from the dead to terrorize them? Let me know what you think in the comments. And now for a quick break, but first, it's shout out time! I wanted to give a big thank you to Nephil420 and Catherine for supporting this channel. We wouldn't be here without you guys. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. A Train for the Dead London was experiencing a corpse problem in the 19th century that resulted in the creation of a railway for the dead. The story I'm about to tell you comes from one of the creepiest periods in English history. It's the story of the London Necropolis Railway. Just before the beginning of the 19th century, London buried their dead in churchyards. But they didn't have very much space for the rapidly growing population. Rapidly growing and rapidly dying. Grave diggers would have to dig up old graves to make room for new burials. And as you can imagine, families weren't too fond of this. The people who had been buried in the graveyard for the longest would basically be evicted for fresher corpses. A solution had to be found, and it had to be found quickly. London experienced an unprecedented population boom in the first half of the 1800s. In 1801, the city had a population of about a million people. But by 1851, the population had grown to 2.5 million. The graveyards were more packed than the pubs. I know that 19th century London is often romanticized in TV and film, but it was a truly stinky place to be. There were so many corpses that the streets stank like death, and all that death resulted in the transmission of diseases. London's water supply became contaminated. People started breaking out with the measles and typhoid fever. Cholera was an epidemic, killing 14,600 people between 1848 and 1849. Do you remember the videos of body bags being stacked on the street in the beginning of 2020? It was a sight that struck panic in the hearts of everyone around the globe. In the 1850s in London, piles of bodies outside buildings were a common sight because there was nowhere to put them. And so, the London Necropolis Railway was born. The project was proposed by Sir Richard Brown. A train would bring bodies from London to a tract of land about 23 miles away. They anticipated London's growth over the next few centuries, thinking the plot of land would be sufficient for the increase in population. Brookwood Cemetery became the premier destination for burials. The train didn't just bring the dead, it also brought the mourners. For 87 years, the train served cadavers and their families. The Railway of the Dead only stopped its service because it was blown up by the Nazis in May of 1941. By the 1970s, Brookwood was abandoned. Today, all that remains of the old dead railway is a memorial plaque and a small section of railway tracks. Cannibal Island Let's take a trip to Cannibal Island, a terrifying place where, for 2,500 years, people ate each other. You're not going to guess which island this is, but I'll give you a hint. It's currently considered a paradise. Plenty of people would give an arm or a leg to vacation here. Yet for centuries, it was a place of horror. 
and unimaginable evil. On Cannibal Island, archaeologists have found physical evidence of the practice dating back to around 500 BC. The evidence is in the form of butchered human bones that were thrown away with other food waste. You know, it's just like your regular neighborhood barbecue with a trash can filled with leftovers of corn on the cob, some gravy, and some chewed up femur bones from your neighbor. Such evidence of cannibalism has been discovered as recently as 1800. The island I'm talking about is Fiji. Eating the flesh of fellow humans is entrenched in Fijian culture. Victims of the horrendous practice were known as bokola. When it happened, it wasn't just for nourishment. It was part of a complex and shocking ritual that would make hardcore cultists a little squeamish. The victim, the bokola, would be brought into the ceremonial area to intense beating of the drums. Fijian men dance the Sibi death dance, as women dance the incredibly seductive Dele dance. As all the dancing was going on, the bokola would be tormented. Then, after much agony, they would finally succumb to death. And that's when the feast would begin. If your mouth is watering, you might have some issues. But what kinds of crimes did these unfortunate victims commit for them to be paraded around and then eaten like a pork chop? Typically, bokola were enemies of the Fijians. Prisoners of war or people captured as slaves were cannibalized. The bodies would be presented to the gods of war, and their skulls would be turned into drinking cups. Okay, Dahmer. Their bones were also crafted into needles. The consumption of every part of the body was a ritualized way to annihilate the victim in totality, leaving not even their spirit behind. I already told you that there has been evidence found of cannibalism as recently as 200 years ago, but historians think it went on until almost the 20th century. The last case of Fijian cannibalism was in 1867, at least, that we know of. The story of the consumed Methodist is one of shock and awe. Keep watching for the full story of Reverend Thomas Baker and the cannibal tribe coming up soon in the video. The Devil Dog If you lived in medieval England, particularly in East Anglia during the 16th century, you might not have liked leaving your home at night. Not because of murderers and thieves, but rather because of a seven-foot-tall mongrel with shaggy black hair and red eyes like the flames of hell. The devil dog, known as Black Shuck, was said to be a beast straight from the depths of infernal damnation. For centuries, tales of this mysterious dog struck fear into the hearts of East Anglians. And now, scientists may have discovered the actual bones of the beast. It's an unbelievable discovery that proves some myths are more than just stories. Supposedly, a single glimpse of the hellhound was enough to give its victim a heart attack. Even a brief encounter would result in them being cursed for the remainder of their life. The creature's most famous attack occurred at the Holy Trinity Church in Blythburg. Legend has it that in 1577, the beast broke through the doors of the church and bounded directly into the congregation. One man and his young boy were killed, and in the chaos, the church steeple fell through the roof. There are mysterious marks on the church doors that were supposedly left by Black Shuck's huge claws. And the terror wasn't over just yet. The hellhound ran for 12 miles to Bungay, where it attacked and killed two worshippers at St. Mary's Church. The violence was allegedly witnessed by clergyman Reverend Abraham Fleming. During excavations in 2014 at Leiston Abbey in Suffolk, researchers found the skeleton of a humongous dog. The dog was seven feet tall, just like the legends claim Black Shuck was. Experts estimated that the dog weighed about 200 pounds. This isn't an April Fool's joke. Google it for yourself if you don't believe me. Scientists really found an unexplainable skeleton that belonged to some sort of vicious canine. This thing was the size of a dire wolf. This dog was massive and shouldn't even exist, yet there it was, buried on church grounds. Could this dog have been the inspiration behind tales of Black Shuck? Could it have been a real beast of hell, slain and buried on holy ground? Let me know your thoughts down below. Scary Aztec Weapons The Aztec warriors of ancient Mexico were known for their fierce brutality in Mesoamerica. For 200 years, the Aztec warriors went undefeated. That is, until the Spanish showed up and brought down their whole civilization. One of the main things the Aztec warriors were good at was wielding violent weapons. 
Check out some of the horrifying Aztec killing instruments in their armory. There was one material the Aztec couldn't live without, obsidian. This is a type of black glass that is typically found around volcanoes. The material was incredibly important to the Aztec, and it was in plentiful supply thanks to the ample volcanoes that dot Mexico. The Aztecs used obsidian to build aqueducts that brought water to their millions of civilians. They used obsidian to build pyramids and ritual objects. Obsidian was even used to make surgical instruments. I bet you didn't know that the Aztec had real surgeons. All right, now let's get to the weapons. I can feel you eager to learn about these instruments of death. Obsidian was so strong that it could be easily shaped into weapons of war, like the Macuajuto. This thing was savage. When the Spanish conquistadors went to war against the Aztec, the Macuajutl was their most feared weapon. It was like a sword mixed with a club, mixed with a baseball bat with the nails driven through it. Conquistador José de Acosta once wrote that this weapon could cut a horse's head off with a single blow. Francisco Hernández de Córdoba wrote that the weapon could divide a man in two parts with one single chop. Yikes. No wonder the Aztec ruled for so long. Each macuahuitl was made from a solid chunk of wood that was a couple of feet long. It had between six and eight serrated obsidian blades stuck into each side of it. It was heavy and had a mean swing. When this thing hit you, the force could break your bones, while the obsidian cut like oversized razor blades. The Aztec had other weapons too, deadly clubs with heads made of solid jade for skull crushing. They had thrusting spears with obsidian blades that could skewer three men at once. Their spears were called tepos topili and could measure over six feet long. Reverend Thomas Baker It's time to continue your terrifying tour of Cannibal Island. On July 21st, 1867, Reverend Thomas Baker was eaten by a remote Fijian tribe. He had been sold to the cannibals for a single whale's tooth. At least, that's one version of the story. It was the last known instance of cannibalism on the tropical island. It's a lot to unpack, I know. Who was Thomas, and why was his life worth one measly tooth? Thomas was a Methodist preacher who lived in Sydney, Australia. In 1859, he traveled to Fiji with his wife with one goal in mind. He wanted to convert the Fijians to the ways of the Methodists. At the time, everyone knew there were cannibals in Fiji. However, missionary work was paying off. On the island of Tonga, Christianity was being accepted by the masses. Thomas even had some success in villages on the island of Bao. He managed to convert Chief Kakobao to Christianity, with the chief declaring himself king of all of Fiji. You might find it typical that the moment the chief converted to Christianity, he immediately started wars with the other tribes on the island. The other tribes were more secluded and didn't want anything to do with the missionaries or Kakobao's claim to kingship. To these other tribes, the white-skinned stranger named Thomas was a spy and a threat. In 1867, Thomas was ready to leave. His wife had given birth to three children in Fiji, and his supervisor was not crediting Thomas for his missionary work. He was going to leave, but he wanted to do one more trip. Thomas wanted to go deeper into the jungle than he had ever gone, farther inland than any missionary before him. But he should have left when he had the chance. Thomas Baker departed for the interior of Viti Levu on July 13th, hoping to make contact with a tribe in unexplored territory. What he didn't know was that he'd been sold out. The chief of the Navuso wanted Baker dead. The chief allegedly sent a messenger forward in front of Thomas with an offering of great worth. The offering was a sperm whale tooth. Whale teeth could only be found from a beached whale or by trading with Tongans, which made them highly prized objects to the Fijians, who called them tabua. The messenger went from village to village offering the tabua to any chief who would agree to eat Thomas Baker when he arrived. Most of the chiefs in the unexplored region didn't want anything to do with white people. They feared them and their weapons and didn't want to incur their wrath. The messenger continued deeper and deeper inland until he reached the village of Nakaka de la Vatu, where the Vatusila tribe lived. They accepted the tabua. Thomas Baker and his party were clubbed and decapitated, and without getting too graphic, I'll say this. Thomas Baker was wrapped in banana leaves, mixed with spinach, and eaten for lunch. 
But like I said, this is just one version of the story. Another account claims that Thomas offered a tribal chief a comb as a gift. But when the chief refused to convert to Christianity, Thomas took back his offering. In the process of doing so, Thomas accidentally touched the chief, which was seen as a disrespectful and violent act. And as a result, the tribe killed and ate him for dinner. Which version sounds more believable to you? Let me know in the comments. The Rope Bound Mummy In Peru, archaeologists excavating an underground tomb found a mummy that would make even the most shameless bondage enthusiasts blush. The mummy was bound in rope, twisted in a bizarre position with their hands covering their face as if they died screaming. The creepy discovery was made about 16 miles from Lima at the site of Cajamarquilla. The mummy died 1,200 years ago, before the Inca Empire even existed. The area was settled by a lesser-known group of ancient Andeans called the Wadi. They arrived around 400 AD and thrived for 200 years. That was as long as the Aztecs thrived for, just to give you some comparison. But then the Wadi were absorbed by the Chima culture. The city of Cajamarquilla is remarkable. It has huge housing units made of mud and brick. There are pyramids, or rather the crumbling remnants of pyramids, that were made in honor of great warriors. It's sad to say that the site hasn't been given that much attention, and it's gradually being destroyed. As the urban world spreads closer to it, more and more of Cajamarquilla is lost. And this leads us to our mysterious mummy. Professor Van Dalen Luna explained that the man was buried with an assortment of funerary goods offerings such as stone tools and ceramic pots. But it's the burial itself that has experts stumped. The man, identified as being in his early 20s, was bound tightly with a lot of rope and a lot of knots. Somebody didn't want the dead man to ever move again. Let me give one more creepy fact before moving on to a mysterious bloody gourd and a beheaded French king. The bound mummy was found with the remains of a dog and a guinea pig. But were these his pets, or maybe snacks for the afterlife? The Blood Gourd Let them eat cake! The immortal words not said by Marie Antoinette shortly before she and her husband, King Louis XVI of France, were executed on January 21, 1793. The French Revolution had reached its goal. The crowd cheered and surged as the guillotine fell and the king's head rolled. Before the king's head stopped rolling, Legends were already starting to form. One of the legends that survives today is that the blood from the dead king's neck stump, I know, it's, it's gross, splattered onto a handkerchief. That handkerchief was then put inside of a gourd. The gourd managed to survive through the next two centuries to wind up in the possession of an unnamed wealthy Italian family. It sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Why would somebody keep a handkerchief splattered by a dead king's blood in a gourd? I don't know why they did it, and in all honesty, nobody knows who did it. All I can say is that according to scientists, the ghoulish artifact is real. In 2013, scientists matched DNA from the blood of the handkerchief with the blood of King Louis XVI. They did this in a kind of roundabout way. Scientists had to get a match from his ancestor, King Henry IV of the 16th century, whose head was stolen. Henry IV became king in 1589 after his predecessor, Henry III, was assassinated by an insane monk. He himself was then assassinated in 1610. Henry's body was embalmed and buried in Paris. Henry's body remained there until the chaos of the French Revolution, the very thing that led to his descendant meeting the guillotine. During the revolutionary riots, looters desecrated Henry's grave, and somebody cut off his head and stole it. It's unclear what happened to Henry's head, but it did find its way into a private collection. And when scientists compared the genetic material from the severed head to genetic material from the mysterious gourd, it was a match. This confirmed that the head belonged to Henry, and the blood in the gourd belonged to Louis. It's all horribly morbid, yet totally captivating. I'd love to know how these mysterious people are getting their hands on such artifacts. The gourd that held the handkerchief was also in a private collection. The Child and the Dogs There's nothing wrong with wanting to be buried with your beloved pet dog. But in the Fayum oasis of Egypt, one kid took things to the extreme. 
Archaeologists recently found the child's grave packed with 142 dogs. Was he the original dog whisperer? The oasis in question is deep in the desert, 62 miles from Cairo. The region is crowded with deserted villages and strange ruins. Not far from the placid water and the palm trees is the ancient city of Crocodilopolis, which is dedicated to Sobek, the Egyptian crocodile god. The oasis is an interesting place, and somewhere everyone should explore when visiting Egypt. Archaeologists have been excavating a necropolis at the oasis for the last few years, and it was only recently that their research brought them to the young person's grave and his army of dogs. Things are so strange that the experts don't have a clue what's going on. Zoologist Galina Belova is the person you call when you need mummified creatures examined. According to Galina, who studied each and every one of the canines, they all died at the same time. All 142 dogs passed away almost instantaneously, yet it doesn't appear that they were sacrificed because they don't show any signs of violence or trauma. So who was the child? Who did the dogs belong to and what caused them to die so suddenly? To make things even weirder, the child was buried with a linen bag over their head. There is only one other similar burial nearby. A random person was found buried with a linen bag over their head and an arrow through their chest. But there doesn't appear to be a correlation. It's all quite a mystery. Victorian Tapeworms Victorian England was a weird and creepy place. One of the weirder things that appeared in the early 1800s was the tapeworm diet. Victorian women were obsessed with gobbling tapeworms until they became emaciated, pale, and feverish. It was all part of the hottest trend of the 1830s, looking like you suffered from consumption, aka tuberculosis. There are definitely some weird fads today, but at least people aren't trying to look like they're dying of disease. To achieve the look of a walking corpse, Victorian-era women would powder their faces with actual white powder, and sometimes they'd wash their skin with poisonous arsenic. To become as skinny as possible, they would wear corsets, and in extreme circumstances, eating a tapeworm proved effective. It was done by swallowing a tapeworm egg. The parasite would hatch, then attach itself to the inner wall of its host's intestines. As a parasite, the worm absorbed nutrients from whatever food the host ate. The worm grew bigger and bigger, while the host had their nutrients vacuumed out of them. Just take a look at some pictures of a tapeworm and tell me that's not the most disgusting thing you've ever seen. Would you really want this creature wriggling around inside you? I certainly wouldn't recommend it. There are even ads that you can find online or in museum archives from the Victorian era promoting tapeworms. They are shocking to see, knowing what we know now. If you thought having a tapeworm in you was bad, just think about how awful it was to get it out. A doctor in Sheffield created a device that could supposedly lure the worm from the body, but when people tried it, they often choked to death. Another method was to hold a glass of milk next to your rear end and wait for the worm to wiggle out. It may seem funny, but what people are willing to sacrifice for vanity and beauty is really sad when you think about it. The Bog Body Across the water from where the Victorian ladies gorged themselves on worms, archaeologists recently found a bog body. It was discovered in Northern Ireland in the remote peatlands near Belagi, where it had remained hidden under the soggy soil for an estimated 2,500 years. Bog bodies are tough things to decipher. According to Detective Inspector Nikki Dehan with the local police service, they couldn't tell if the remains were ancient or recent. The police excavated the body with full forensic consideration, unsure if they were dealing with a murder. Ultimately, the case turned out to be too cold even for Northern Ireland's best. They found that the bog body was preserved in its amazing state due to the low levels of oxygen inside the spongy soil. The body belonged to a teenage boy who perished around the age of 17. It's a mystery how he died, and it's also a mystery as to where his head might be. Almost all of the teen's bones were discovered except the head. His skull is nowhere to be seen. Could it have been kept as a kind of morbid trophy? Maybe by his killer? To date, there have been over 1,000 bog bodies excavated from the soggy peatlands of Europe. The most famous is the Tolland Man that was discovered in Denmark. While all the bodies are different, most of them have one specific thing in common. They were considered to be deviants, 
People who were left dead in bogs were usually criminals or victims of sacrifice, or sometimes an accidental drowning victim. Right now, nobody knows how the bog boy met his end, but considering the missing skull, I suspect foul play. Thanks for watching. Which of these creepy ancient mysteries did you find the most disturbing? Let me know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Ancient Mass Slave Burial A little less than 2,000 years ago during the Roman occupation of Britain, several dozen slaves worked at an elite village in what is now Somerset, England. When they died, they were often buried with brooches, pottery, and other grave goods. Their graves were discovered last year while a school was being built on the property. Archaeologists excavated the remains of 50 people, who they think were mostly ancient Brits who were native to the area and adopted Roman customs. Small nails found at some of the individual's feet showed that they were laid to rest wearing their leather hobnail work boots. A few of the skeletons seem to belong to higher-ranking members of society, including one woman who was buried with her head on a pillow. They likely lived and worked at a nearby villa, even though no traces of one have been found yet. The team has identified the remains of other buildings, including a barn and an outhouse, as well as traces of Iron Age roundhouses. Evidence shows that the enslaved laborers adhere to a mix of Roman and Iron Age customs. Lead archaeologist Steve Membury described the site as the most comprehensive modern excavation of a Roman cemetery in Somerset. He credits modern technology with making the discovery possible and hopes to carry out DNA and isotope testing on the remains to learn more about who the individuals were. A Constipated Death Sometime between 1400 and 1000 years ago, a man living in what is now southwest Texas survived mostly on grasshoppers during the final months of his life. He suffered from Chagas disease, which prevented him from digesting food properly and led to malnourishment. The man also had a painful condition called megacolon, which causes a person's colon to swell up to six times its normal size. His remains were discovered in a rock shelter in 1937. Since then, scientists have performed numerous studies on them. Recent research found that during the final two to three months of his life, the man was likely unable to walk or eat on his own. In the words of researcher Carl Reinhardt, it appears as though the ailing man's caretakers removed the legs from grasshoppers and fed him these squishable parts of the insects. Reinhardt explained that the grasshoppers would have been high in moisture and protein, making it easier for him to eat when his megacolon was in its early stages. Another recent study found that his body contained the remains of food that he was unable to digest, as well as 2.6 pounds of feces, which means that he was extremely constipated for months. One thing is especially clear, the man's death was slow and excruciating. The findings also show that his culture valued taking care of their sick, even when it meant that the person couldn't do much to contribute to society. Essentially, this discovery, while kind of creepy, indicates earlier civilizations engaged in a type of hospice care, making them less primitive than we might have believed. The Blood of Saint Januarius Saint Januarius was a bishop in Italy who died as a martyr in 305 AD. Little else is known about him. He was supposedly thrown to some wild bears who beheaded him. Some of his blood was placed into a container and brought to Naples. To this day, the blood is kept in a sealed glass vessel at the Cathedral of Naples, where he is the patron saint. The dried blood is said to liquefy on three separate occasions every year, September 19th, December 16th, and the Saturday before the first Sunday in May. Thousands of spectators gather for these events in hopes of witnessing the miracle firsthand. The blood sometimes fails to liquefy, which many consider to be a sign of an impending catastrophe. A famine in 1559, a cholera outbreak in 1833, the beginning of World War II, and the Nazi occupation of Italy all happened around times when the blood of St. Januarius remained dry. This also happened in 1973. Later that year, a cholera epidemic swept through Naples. Then, in 1980, the blood's failure to liquefy was connected with the deaths of 2,900 people in an earthquake in southern Italy. It was the worst natural disaster in Italian post-war history. 
When the blood stayed dry in December 2016, the chapel's abbot urged people to continue praying in hopes that it would transform. But nothing happened, so the abbot urged worshippers to continue praying and to avoid thinking about tragedies. In a strange turn of events, Cardinal Crescenzio Sepe, the Archbishop of Naples, fell ill as the blood was liquefying in September 2018. Out of nowhere, he felt faint and had to sit down. On the bright side, at least the blood transformed, perhaps avoiding even bigger problems. Nataruk Massacre When two groups of people fight, one usually has something tangible that the other one wants, such as land or valuables. But researchers initially struggled to determine a motive for why a band of attackers brutally massacred a group of locals 10,000 years ago in what is now Kenya. Human remains that were found along what was once the southwestern edge of Lake Turkana bear signs of horrifying injuries caused by arrows and clubs. The bodies consist of 21 adults and 6 children who died violently. They were killed using weapons made from obsidian that was sourced from far away, indicating that the assailants were outsiders who were new to the area. At the time, people lived in nomadic groups of hunter-gatherers. The massacre victims left behind no signs of any nearby settlements or valuables. So if the attackers didn't like the group they crossed paths with, couldn't they have just avoided a confrontation and gone in a different direction? Experts are still learning about the dynamics between different hunter-gatherer societies, so they don't have a solid answer to that question yet. Archaeologist Marta Mirason Lar explained that the preconditions for warfare among humans have been present since before we had civilizations, farming, material wealth, and social hierarchies. In other words, people have always been prepared to fight. She suggested that the beachside location was a desirable place to eat and hunt, and that this might have motivated the attackers to slaughter their victims. Big shout out to Melissa Watson and the Blue Moon. Thanks so much for spending time with us and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, welcome, and be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. A Looted Grave Conservation officers in Harrison County, Indiana, received what was probably one of the strangest calls of their careers in 2016, when they were summoned to the site of a looted 19th century grave. Located on a remote, privately owned property, the burial belonged to someone named Nancy Brown, who died at age 47 in 1881. Her grave was located among others in a cemetery with no public access, which means that the trespassers somehow knew what they were looking for. In other words, it appeared to be a very planned and deliberate act. It was a disturbing scene, according to conservation officer Jim Schreck, who told reporters that he believed multiple people worked together to carry tools to the site. They would have had to haul the equipment on foot for at least a half mile. Archaeologists reported to the scene to assist with the investigation. Unfortunately, they couldn't tell how much time had passed between the looting and when the landowner discovered the damage. It's also unclear what the motives were or why Nancy Brown's grave was targeted. When the story hit headlines, investigators were working with genealogists to locate any of Brown's surviving relatives. They were also eager to find the grave robbers. It's unknown what, if anything, ever came of the story. What do you think was the reason behind the grave robbery? Let me know your theories in the comments below. Unknown Man E during the late 19th century, French Egyptologist Gaston Maspero was unwrapping mummies that were found in Egypt's Valley of the Kings, when he came across the remains of a young man bearing no clues to his identity. He was wrapped in sheepskin, which the ancient Egyptians considered to be an unclean material. Even more strangely, the man's hands and feet were bound, and he appeared to be screaming. He also wasn't mummified according to traditional customs. The absence of an incision on his abdomen serving as clear evidence that his internal organs hadn't been removed. Maspero and his colleagues concluded that the man had been poisoned to death or asphyxiated or met some other type of foul play. Still unaware of his identity, they nicknamed him Unknown Man E. Scientists still don't know who he was. One theory proposes that Unknown Man E was a Hittite prince. According to the royal archives, the prince was murdered near the Egyptian border after being sent there to marry King Tut's widow. As a foreigner, he would not have received the typical mummification and burial that were given to members of Egyptian society. 
Another idea suggests that Unknown Man E was a high-ranking individual who died in an area where mummification knowledge and technology were scarce, perhaps while on a military campaign. And maybe the culture that handled his body did not view sheepskin in the same negative context that the Egyptians did and meant no disrespect to the remains. A third theory entertains the possibility that Unknown Man E is Ramses III's son, Prince Pentewere, who was executed for participating in a conspiracy against his father. Unfortunately, experts are no closer now than they were a century ago to identifying the mummy. Weeping Statues A plaster statue of the Madonna in Syracuse, Sicily has been continuously shedding tears since 1953. It's one of dozens of Catholic statues that have allegedly been seen crying, but it's the only one recognized by the church as a true miracle. All other reported sightings of weeping statues are either unverified or were proven to be hoaxes. The Catholic Church investigates these types of claims very thoroughly and they are not quick to label something a miracle. Instead, officials prefer to let the phenomenon play out to see if signs of a hoax appear or if the event is ultimately disproved by science. The statues in question are known to cry a variety of liquids, including human blood, tears, olive oil, and scented oils. Some cases, such as the crying Padre Pio statue in Sicily, are quickly debunked as the deceptive result of someone placing the tears on the statue. In this case, a woman used her own blood. Other instances of crying statues are less clear-cut. In 2018, for example, an Our Lady of Guadalupe sculpture began shedding tears of scented olive oil at a church in New Mexico. The substance, known as chrism, is considered sacred when blessed. At first, even the church's priest admittedly struggled to believe that the phenomenon was real. According to the church's business manager, however, a thorough review of their security footage proved that nobody could have done anything to make the statue cry artificially. But skepticism remains high, and even the famed Madonna of Syracuse statue has more or less been debunked by science. In 1995, a chemistry researcher at the University of Pavla named Luigi Garlas Kelly claimed to have figured out how a simple plaster statue could be manipulated into crying on its own. But it's very difficult to gain access to relics for experimental or investigative purposes, and the Madonna of Syracuse therefore retains its miraculous status for now. Kudna Hora Mass Grave The 14th century cemetery church of All Saints in the Czech Republic has a long-established macabre reputation. Nicknamed the Bone Church, this UNESCO World Heritage Site is famous for housing the bones of somewhere between 40,000 and 70,000 people, including 14th century plague victims and those who died in the Bohemian Wars. The bones line the walls and ceiling and are arranged decoratively throughout the church, including in the chandelier. The property's dark history deepened in 2017 when archaeologists announced the nearby discovery of the remains of more than 1,200 people. They made the grisly discovery while renovating the medieval ossuary and church, which had started leaning because the soil was unstable. The bodies were found inside 34 mass graves, which contained victims of the Black Death and a famine in the 1300s. It was not a great time to be alive, it looks like. It might be the largest burial ground ever discovered in Europe. Men outnumbered women, indicating that the deceased were a mining population. Additional research shows that the cemetery became a popular burial place because it supposedly contains a handful of soil from the hill where Jesus was crucified. Eventually, the cemetery reached its capacity, and the church's lower level became a place for storing excess bones from mass burials and old graves that had fallen into disrepair. Starting in 1870, the bones were arranged into the elaborate patterns seen at the church today. Bizarre Burials while working at the Beshtasheni burial site in southeastern Georgia in 2016, archaeologists discovered 16 strange graves dating back to the Late Bronze and Early Iron Ages. Most were covered with stone slabs or a stone or dirt mound. One of the most interesting burials belonged to a headless man and woman, who were presumably a couple. There were two bronze arrows lodged into the female's body, one in her leg and one in her ribs near her heart and it's very possible that this is what caused her death. 
She was somewhere between 17 and 25 years old when she died. The man buried next to her was between 19 and 25. The pair were placed in fetal positions on their right sides. Their grave contained an iron dagger, a brown strip covered in geometric designs, and a collection of ceramic vessels. Another bizarre burial contained the head of another woman who was also between 17 and 25 years old when she died. Her skull was surrounded by grave goods, including beads, small vessels, and a handful of metal objects. The largest and most remarkable grave was occupied by a man who was buried in fetal position. He was accompanied by a 1.6-foot-long dagger decorated with images of deer and horses, as well as bronze and iron arrowheads, animal bones, and a horn. The burial also contained something called a pedestal vessel. These tall, slender containers have a large upper lip and are unique to the region. Interestingly, a lot of them were found at the site. A lot of weapons were also unearthed from the cemetery, indicating that the society had a strong militaristic culture and that it buried its soldiers alongside its farmers. Spines on Sticks In the Chincha Valley on the Peruvian coast, researchers unearthed 192 human spines. These spines weren't connected to the rest of the bodies, but rather threaded onto posts made of reeds. To get a good idea of what this looks like, imagine taking somebody's spine, then threading all the pieces onto a long stick, almost like a club made of bones. That's exactly what the people here did 500 years ago. It was a brutal yet fascinating burial tradition that was only practiced in this one place in Peru. Forget about the rest of the country and even all of South America. The Chincha Valley was the only place where people put spines on reeds. The archaeological team excavated 20 different sites in the region and found evidence of the practice at every single one of them. Why did they do it? The best guess anyone has is that the practice started after the invasion of Peru by the Europeans. It was fairly normal for European settlers to damage graves by looting them in search of treasure. For the Chincha people, this was unacceptable. An important part of their culture was to bury dead people fully intact with all their bones. With the graves disturbed and the skeletons ruined, archaeologists believe the Chincha put what few remains they could find back together as a sort of spine on the cob. They then reburied the spine in hopes the dead could continue to be at rest. Mummified Mongolian Monk In Mongolia, a mummified monk was discovered by a local man rummaging through a mysterious cave. This man first took the mummified monk back to his home in the Mongolian capital of Ulaanbaatar before trying to sell it on the black market. Local police got wind of his plan, swooped in and arrested him, and the monk was taken to a lab to be studied. Even though the monk is clearly a mummy, he is not actually that old. He's also, depending on who you ask, not dead. Buddhist doctor to the Dalai Lama, Dr. Barry Curzon, says the man is in a state called Tukdam. This is the deepest stage of meditation that a person can go into. If one is able to stay in this highly concentrated state for more than three weeks, their body shrinks. They slowly decay until nothing is left except hair and nails, and a rainbow appears somewhere in the sky overhead. In scientific terms, a monk in the Tukdam state is in fact slowly starving themselves to death until their heart stops beating. Whether a rainbow appears overhead or not, the monk still meditates themselves directly into the afterlife. That's what happened to this monk, who sat down in the lotus position in that cave, was covered in cattle skin, and left for over 200 years. Hair Bedsheets Perhaps the worst bedsheet in the entire world was recently on exhibition at the Museum of London Docklands. There is an inscription embroidered at the bottom of the sheet in human hair, which quite likely came from a severed head. It's the bedding version of a book bound in human flesh, a sheet embroidered with real human hair. And while that itself wouldn't be out of the ordinary for the 1700s, the fact that the hair came from a decapitated person just makes it gruesome. Perhaps even stranger is that the bed sheet was never intended to be gruesome. It was embroidered as a tribute to James Radcliffe, the grandson of King Charles II. James was executed on February 24, 1716, for the role he played in the Jacobite Rising. This was a rebellion that happened in England 300 years ago. James' wife was Anna Maria Radcliffe. In the four months that James awaited execution in the Tower of London, Anna Maria was allowed to stay with him. After James was killed by decapitation with an axe, his body was stitched back together and handed over to Maria. She then took hair from his head, 
hair from her own head and made a sheet with it. Researchers at the museum are fairly certain she used James' and her own hair because the embroidery is clearly in two different colors. In her grief, Maria crafted a morbid reminder on the linens. The Sacrifices of Yinshu The burial ground at the Chinese archaeological site of Yinshu, used during the Shang dynasty, has revealed some pretty brutal practices. By studying the chemical composition of the human remains here, archaeologists learned they were ritually sacrificed. But that wasn't all they endured. These people, believed to have once been soldiers captured by the Chinese during warfare, were enslaved and then tortured. The victims were put to work for several years, kept alive on the most meager of diets, and forced into labor until they outgrew their usefulness. At that time, their captors would sacrifice them in a great ceremony. Here's a bit of background on the Shang Dynasty. They ruled the area of the Yellow River Valley from the 16th to the 11th century BC. It was around 1300 BC when the first major city in China was constructed by the Shang, called Yinshu. Its ruins, where this burial ground was discovered, are near the modern city of Anyang. But it was during the final two centuries of Shang rule that they really began to get barbaric. There was something happening that destabilized the society. In a desperate last attempt at saving themselves, they began slaughtering people to appease the gods. This is similar to what happened near the end of the Maya Empire when they got desperate for rain to grow their crops, just before the entire civilization collapsed. In China, archaeologists have estimated 13,000 people were killed as sacrifices in a span of just 200 years. The bodies discovered in the graveyard here did not come from Yinshu. Analysis revealed they came from farther away, meaning the victims were captured and brought to the city. Researchers were even able to look at their diet by analyzing the bone collagen of their skeletons. They found that these people were eating gruel made from millet, barely even food. This was worse food than the poorest villagers ate. The consensus is that as the Shang collapsed, they started sacrificing their slaves to make their gods happy. Aztec Ritual House Experts with the National Institute of Anthropology and History in Mexico carried out excavations in the ancient Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. They were looking at a housing complex when they found a ritual structure that had been used in complex and scary ceremonies. It was more of a ritual house, a specific kind of temple that wasn't officially a temple. The house was most likely used for rituals to mark the beginning and the end of life cycles. Archaeologists found incense burners, vessels for holding ceremonial liquids, and the cremated skeleton of an infant inside a pot. They also discovered musical instruments made from bone, such as flutes and ocarinas. All of these date back to the 16th century, sometime between 1521 and 1610, right after the Spanish conquered the city and defeated the Aztec. Nobody knows exactly what the ceremonies being performed would have looked like, but based on the archaeological evidence, there was a lot of music, a lot of smoke, and a lot of fire. We don't know if this infant was deceased before the cremation inside the pot, or if the death was part of a sacrifice. It could also be that the ritual was in honor of the infant, as a celebration of life and death. It's all quite mysterious. What do you think was going on in this ancient Aztec house 500 years ago? Let me know your theories in the comments. Big shout out to Joker Joel and Jennifer Ballesteri. Thanks so much for joining us. And if you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos about scary archaeological discoveries. Fed to the Lions Archaeologists in England discovered a bronze key handle carved kind of strangely. The key handle was carved to depict a lion and a man locked in combat. Experts say this could be a real reflection of what was happening in Britain under Roman rule 2,000 years ago. But it's not quite as innocent as it may seem. Men weren't simply fighting lions for sport. Instead, archaeologist John Pierce says it had to do with executions. He believes the Romans used to throw prisoners into a lion pit in front of spectators, who could then watch the ghoulish show as the lions ripped men limb from limb. The key handle was initially discovered in 2017 while excavating a Roman townhouse in Leicester. It's only about four inches long, crafted around the year 200. The man fighting the lion has long hair and a bushy beard, which has made archaeologists believe he was supposed to represent a barbarian. To the Romans, a barbarian was anyone not from Rome. And because Roman law allowed criminals to be thrown to wild beasts as punishment, this may be what the key was made to represent. What was just a myth prior to this discovery now looks very real. If you weren't Roman and you did something the Romans didn't like and determined to be a criminal offense, you would be in danger of being fed to some hungry lions that had been exported to England from North Africa or Mesopotamia. 
A Lair of Bones A disturbing lair of bones was found in a gruesome subterranean cavern in Saudi Arabia. The lair is just as horrifying as it sounds. Archaeologists found the remains of at least 14 different animals here, including human beings. The hollow cave is called Umm Jirsan and is a system of winding lava tunnels cut through solid rock by volcanic activity many, many years ago. It's located beneath the volcanic fields of Harat Kabar. It was long after these tunnels were formed and the volcanic activity settled down that so many bones found their way here. Researchers believe the bones were carried into the cave by hyenas over a span of 7,000 years. The whole cavern system may as well have been taken straight out of the Lion King. It was likely a den used by a family of hyenas who dominated it for thousands of years. They brought their kills and scavenged carcasses back to the cave and devoured them, leaving the bones to accumulate over time. The only thing scientists are unsure of is if the human skeletons found in the cave were from people who had been hunted by the hyenas. Either that, or they were corpses that the hyenas dug out of the graves, which is possible with these scavengers. A Salty Sheep's Leg Sometime around the year 600 BC, mining operations started at the Cherabad salt mine in northwestern Iran. Salt mining continued here all the way into the 20th century, just until a few decades ago. When activity finally stopped, archaeologists were able to go in and explore the location for historical research. Since 1993, experts have uncovered the bodies of eight ancient miners who have been left dead in the deep underground tunnels. What's truly fascinating is that their bodies have been mummified to perfection by the salt-rich soil and dry atmosphere. But that's not all. Archaeologists have also found plenty of mummified animals. One of the weirdest things they discovered was a sheep leg that had been left in the mine about 1,600 years ago. The dry conditions left the DNA of the sheep in amazing condition. Researchers from Trinity College Dublin were able to see exactly what kind of animal this was. Amazingly, it showed no evidence of being a woolly, fleeced sheep. Instead, the sheep was hairy like a wolf, not fluffy like sheep we're familiar with today. But why was the sheep deep in a salt mine 1,600 years ago? It was probably taken down there as a snack. The miners likely ate the rest of the sheep, which is why only its salty leg was found. Peruvian Mummies A brand new and very ghoulish discovery was announced by Peruvian archaeologists in 2022. Eight mummified children were found inside a tomb. The tomb belonged to an elite member of a pre-Inca society who died 1,200 years ago. The eight mummified children had been sacrificed upon his death as part of an ancient funerary ritual. The research team was led by Yomira Silvia Huaman of the National University of San Marcos. They were excavating the archaeological complex of Cajamarquilla when they stumbled upon the skeletal remains of a high-ranking person. Outside the tomb were the skeletons of 12 adults and some animals that may or may not have been llamas. It's too early to say who this individual might have been. Archaeologists right now are guessing he was a wealthy trader who died before the age of 30. He was mummified and had his hands tied over his face before being wrapped in cloth and put in the ground. The small skeletons of the children may have been very close relatives of the merchant. Although the mere notion of sacrificing children is horrific to us, it was an honor for people living back then. They didn't see death as the end, but as a beginning. When those children were buried alongside the dead man, no one thought of them as deceased. They simply thought they were going to help a wealthy relative in the transition to a parallel world. Headless Horse Archaeologists in Germany have discovered the remains of the headless horseman in an ancient cemetery. Or rather, they found the skeletal remains of a headless horse as well as the man who presumably rode it. The man and his headless horse were buried 1,400 years ago in the town of Nidlingen. This was during the Merovingian dynasty, which ruled from 476 to 750 in a large part of Central Europe. When the Roman Empire fell in 476, it was the Merovingian kingdom that rose up to seize power and begin laying claim to all the land. It was this kingdom that consisted of two major tribes, the Franks and the Germanics. The Franks would go on to become the French, and the Germanic, the Germans. It's unclear who the writer was, or even why he was buried with a headless horse. Archaeologists don't think it was a sacrifice, but probably part of a burial ceremony. Archaeologist Folk Daminger says the man was likely the head of a farming household, and so he was buried with a horse as a grave good. But why they had to cut the beast's head off is anyone's guess. Thanks for watching! Which of these discoveries did you find the most unnerving? Let me know in the comments below, and remember to subscribe if you haven't already. See you soon for more videos like these. Bye!